everyone. Um, thanks for being here for day two of Debucks. I thought day one was awesome, so I'm excited about um, excited about today. Uh, my name is John Dahl, and uh, co-founder with Matt at uh, Mux. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, what we learn from science, and especially the science of human perception, when we uh, create video and work with video. Um, you might remember four years ago, uh, Matt Satmarie gave a talk at the very first Debux called What Idiot Designed This? Uh, and if you've worked with video for any length of time, you've probably, you probably resonate with that question. There's a lot of weirdness in video. There's a lot of artifacts of the analog world that still are in the digital world, or decisions that made a lot of sense decades ago, or even, even over a century ago in some cases that, we're, that we still live with. Um, this talk is kind of going to be the opposite of that. I'm going to talk about what in science, or sorry, what in video makes sense. What comes from the natural world, what comes from science, what comes from the way humans see and hear. Um, and hopefully this will help us understand what's good and maybe what we can make better in video. So real quick, my qualifications here, I am not a trained scientist. Um, I have an engineering background, uh, but I did study graduate level philosophy. And up before you know, the 18th century, science was actually considered a sub-discipline of philosophy. Uh, so as long as I stick to the like, medieval science, I'm pretty well qualified to give this talk. So get ready. We're going to talk a lot about Aristotle and leeches. So all right. First thing is aspect ratios. Um, and I want to start us off with an experiment. Uh, everyone right now, look around the room for the most visually interesting things that you can find. Cool. Um, so I want you to notice what happened when you did that to your head. Did your head mostly go like this or mostly go like that? Um, from here, it sure seemed like it mostly went like that. Um, and there's a reason for that. Humans live effectively on a plane. Um, see, medieval science. Uh, the, the, the Earth is not literally flat, but phenomenologically, we experience it as flat. Um, we live on a plane. And gravity binds us very tightly down to that plane. Uh, it turns out to be very expensive in terms of energy to move up the y-axis. Uh, it's kind of dangerous to go down the y-axis. So we kind of live on this horizontal axis. Um, it's where we evolved to watch for predators, to find food, to find a mate. Um, and you can actually see this in the way human vision has evolved. Every vertebrate animal has binocular vision. We have two eyes, and they're always situated horizontally. Uh, even birds who you know, spend a lot of time up and down have this sort of horizontal field of vision. Uh, spiders have like eight eyes, and they go like that. Um, so the aspect ratio of human vision looks something like this. It's about 200 degrees horizontal by about 135 degrees vertical. Um, this varies uh, based on individual differences between people, but it's kind of like this. Um, so let's compare that to the aspect ratios we use in video. 4 by 3 kind of fits that field of vision reasonably well. 16 by 9 is a little bit wider than that field of vision. Um, cinematic aspect ratios, like 2.35 to 1, are quite a bit wider than the field of vision. Um, but unless you're doing VR, this is not actually how you watch. You don't actually immerse your field of vision in a screen. The screen sits inside your field of vision. Uh, so it's not like we have to perfectly match the human field of vision with the displays we use. Uh, and we also don't just sit passively and take in a screen. Uh, we actually have a very narrow ability to focus. And when we watch, we watch a point. Uh, the eye has a thing called a fovea. It's, the most, uh, it's, it's about the size of your thumb at arm's length, a little bigger than your thumb at arm's length. And that's the area that you can focus on. Outside of that, um, your vision gets blurry pretty quickly. So when we watch video, it's more like this. Um, we scan around. We're active. Um, so again, we don't have to match our, our screens to our field of vision, uh, but it makes sense to fit our screens well within the field of vision. Um, so I'm going to play a little movie clip here. Um, and I want you, as you watch this, to think, do I wish I had more content left and right or more content up and down? So even though that's dinosaurs, which are like real tall, uh, there's still more that goes on on the, in the horizontal world. Um, OK, got it. So vertical video bad, horizontal video good. Uh, must mean like Leonardo was an idiot, because he painted 
paint things up and down, right? Um, well, not exactly, because still images have a difference from video. The difference is the degree of change. There's no change in a still image, and there is change in a video. Um, so I've actually come up with a rule that we can apply here. Uh, after a lot of thought, um, about five minutes, I came up with John's law of vertical video, which says the appropriateness of a vertical orientation decreases exponentially with the amount of change. So in a formula, it's A, uh, the appropriateness is equal to 1 divided by E raised to the power of the amount of change. Uh, so a still image that doesn't change uh, is perfectly appropriate in a vertical orientation. Um, something like HQ, it's got a little bit of change, but not too much. Um, well, we have to be tough. Oh, sorry. Ah, maybe it's not going to play. Um, not a lot of change. Vertical might be okay for that. Uh, you might, it's not going to win any like cinematography awards, but you might, uh, the fact that the person has a vertical orientation might make this make sense. Uh, but a two hour movie with a lot of change just well, makes no sense to be vertical. Big. I mean, he had to um, so, yeah, next time you, you know like you know take, <laughs> uh, I didn't mean to figure your sound on that. Next time you take video of your kids, uh, hold your phone like that. Next time you like record the police doing something, don't go like that, go like that. Um, whatever you do, don't be this guy. Make a gif of that. Okay. Second thing we're going to talk about is resolution. What's like the max resolution that the eye can see? Uh, well, to answer this, we have to understand that vision is angular. Um, we said earlier we see a field of vision about 135 degrees vertically by 200 degrees horizontally. Um, and so the um, what we see, the size of what we see, varies with distance. Um, so the question is, like, what's the smallest thing you can see when we're talking about resolution? Um, and it turns out the uh, he, uh, he, typical human vision can see about one arc minute, somewhere between that and maybe 0.3 arc minutes at the limit of the most accurate um, vision. Uh, an arc minute is 1 60th of a degree, um, so point. 0166 repeating degrees down to about 0 0.005 degrees. Uh, there's a formula that tells us what's the smallest size of a thing we can see. Uh, it looks like this. Uh, the size is two times the distance times the tangent of the angle divided by two. Um, so I actually did a little bit of uh, research on this. Um, I asked my colleagues to measure the distance between uh, their eyes and the various screens that they use. Uh, and here's what we came up with. For a laptop display, uh, the average MUX employee sits about 21.5 inches away from their screen, which means they can see a pixel density of about 160 pixels per inch up to maybe 532 pixels per inch maximally. Um, desktop a little further, 132 to 441. A phone a little bit closer, 15 inches, uh, pixel density of 228 to 760, again, based on how precisely they can see. Um, I didn't do this for a television because there's so much variation in how far people sit from their TVs. So I just picked a number like 10 feet. Uh, and at 10 feet, this is sort of the pixel density that you ideally would have on a television. So I compared these to some devices in the real world. Um, and you see for each of these devices, the actual pixel density is somewhere between that sort of min and max point. And these are retina displays uh, by Apple or 4K TVs. If this was a 1080p TV, we'd be under the level we want to get to. Um, but this kind of makes sense. Like We've gotten to higher pixel density displays, and we're kind of in that range that we want to be in. You might, you might expect maybe like these numbers are going to go up over the next decade, but they're not going to go up by like 10x. Maybe they go up by 2x. Um, and then I also calculated, if we want to play video on these screens, what's the max resolution that we need in these viewing conditions? Uh, and the max resolution. Uh, is here, and I put it in Ks to kind of make it easy. Um, three, 4K, um, we, we need to get to that level um, to really take maximal advantage of the optimal human eye, uh, but we don't need to go that much above it. Um, on a TV, like 4K for one size, 6K if you're sitting real close to a giant TV, but 8K is not really that important um, there. Uh, the, the place it might be important would be like a reasonably large display that you're sitting really close to, like a 27-inch um, monitor. All right. Third topic is moves on to hearing. We're going to talk about audio sample rates. So sound is a matter of pressurized waves, vibrations that happen in a medium like air or water or solid. 
Um, there's no sound in a vacuum, um, as we know from Firefly and not from most other science fiction shows. Um, we hear from this little thing called the cochlear duct, which sits in our inner ear. It's a little spiral filled with fluid and little hairs that sense vibrations. Uh, and it starts at about 20,000 hertz and kind of goes down from there. Um, so the upper limit of human hearing is generally about 20,000 hertz. Um, the lower limit is about 20 hertz, which is pretty low. The lowest note on a piano is about 28 hertz, so it's even lower than that. Um, but at the upper limit, uh, 20,000 hertz is kind of the, the shorthand to use. Um, most of us can't actually hear that, though. As we age, our high uh, frequency hearing goes down. Um, so I'm actually going to um, do a little hearing test for us all here. Uh, so I'm going to play some test tones, see if this works, um, and listen to the point at which you no longer hear this. OK. 10,000 hertz, 12. 14, I bet we're starting to lose some people. 15, 16, 17,000 hertz. All right, who can still hear at 18? Like 10, 20, maybe 20, 20, okay. 19, anyone? All right, one more. Can anyone hear 20,000 hertz? It's actually going. We checked the um, like SPL meter here. Um, so, so anyway, that, that's, that's the range that we have to worry about when we um, capture sound. Uh, other animals can hear higher, but we don't really care about that. Uh, so 20,000 hertz is the upper limit of hearing. 15,000 hertz is about the upper limit of my hearing. Um, but sound is analog. Sound is actual physical continuous waves that we hear. We don't hear digitally, but we're talking about digital audio and video today. Uh, so how do we capture this analog sound digitally? Well, uh, without going into most of the details here, um, part of the answer is we sample. Um, so we take this analog waveform and we sample it at an interval. Um, let's call that the sample rate. Uh, and it turns out the frequency with which we sample determines how the, the frequency that we can actually capture. Uh, which makes sense. If you take a sample every one second, how would you know if something is happening 10 times a second, right? Um, so there's a theorem called the Nyquist theorem or the Nyquist-Shannon theorem, which says that an analog waveform can be fully captured digitally when the sample rate is twice the waveform frequency. So if we want to capture 20,000 hertz, we need to sample at at least 40,000 hertz, um, which if you know anything about audio, you know we're getting pretty close to, uh, to where we actually capture sound. Um, but we want to go a little bit further, and that's because of something called aliasing. Aliasing is uh, artifacts that can come in uh, when you sample, high frequency artifacts that can come in when you sample uh, an analog signal digitally. Uh, there's spatial aliasing, which you see on the left. Uh, there's temporal aliasing, which can happen in um, video with like the wagon wheel effect. Uh, and then there's also temporal aliasing in sound. I'm going to play a couple sine waves here, followed by aliased sine waves, so you can hear what the sound's like. Hear that? So we want to get rid of those artifacts. And the way you do it is by applying a filter. You can apply an anti-aliasing filter or a low-pass filter, which rolls off those high-frequency sounds. Uh, but it doesn't happen instantly. You actually need sort of a bandwidth range with which to apply the filter. Um, and that's why, back in 1979, Sony chose 44,100 hertz as the sample rate for CDs. Um, a lot of the audio we deal with today is 48,000 hertz, uh, which is kind of in the same ballpark. Um, so those are good choices. They're based on an understanding of the science of human hearing and digital signal processing. Um, what about higher sample rates? Uh, you might be asking, like, what about those super audio CDs or DVD audio uh, CDs out there? Um, people say they hear better sound at like 96 or 192. Um, it turns out there's actually like no either theoretical or measurable reason for using higher sample rates. In fact, they can, uh, high sample rates can actually be worse. And I'm probably going to offend a few people here by saying that because you are invested in like you know uh, high quality audio or sample uh, high sample rates. Um, but then again, some people think that $5,000 speaker cables 
make their system sound better, uh, despite the fact that there's, not, uh, there's no double-blind tests or measurable reasons why that would be true. Uh, and some people bought something called a Tice clock back in the 90s. Um, this was a clock that you plugged in next to your stereo. It wasn't even in the signal, next to the stereo, uh, and it improved electron coherence. And a lot of people wrote reviews and said that they really heard better sound from this thing. Uh, it turns out that this is just like a rebadged $20 Radio Shack clock. Um, so it's helpful to uh, not always just trust your brain, but also to look at the science behind these kind of things. All right, fourth, um, we're going to talk about frame rates. Um, what's the <coughs> maximal frame rate that we can see? Uh, well, we know um, from Matt Satmarie's talk four years ago that we use a 60 hertz clock in NTSC countries and a 50 hertz clock in PAL countries uh, for um, refresh rates on video. Um, because video was interlaced and we had two fields per frame, we actually had a frame rate of something like 30 hertz or maybe 25 hertz uh, in various countries. We also know in NTSC countries that it wasn't exactly 30 because there were phase conflicts between the color signal and the black and white signal. Uh, so we ended up with the weird 29.97 thing. Um, but whatever the case, most video we watch today is 24, 25, or 30 frames per second. So why is that? Is that like the right number? Um, Turns out there's not a single right number here. Um, this is kind of complicated. Um, but you can kind of triangulate to what good frame rates are in a few different ways. Um, the first way is by finding visual continuity. Um, the brain can process independently about 10 images per second. So if I were to hold up very quickly 10 images, you might see them as individual images. But at some point, you start to see it as continuous motion. Your brain applies kind of like a motion blur filter. Um, so I have a few videos here uh, encoded at different frame rates. Um, and I want you to watch these and see what's the point at which you no longer see the individual images, but you start to see smooth motion. So here's five frames per second. It's 10. Fifteen. Twenty. So at some point along there, probably your brain switched from seeing individual images to seeing motion. Um, it usually happens in the 10 to 12 to 15 frames per second range. Uh, it depends on the type of content, depends on the observer. Um, but regardless, we can kind of say the floor of a good frame rate is probably 15 frames per second. Um, maybe 18 if you want to be safe. Um, okay, that's the floor. The next question is like, how fast can humans see? Um, this is a hard one, and there's not like a single answer to this. Um, there was some research done by the Air Force um, a few decades ago where pilots could actually see, they could identify a plane in an image that was flashed in 1 2 20th of a second. So pilots could see at 220 hertz, but pilots have exceptional vision. You have to, if you're a pilot, um, other research shows many of us, you know, at 150 hertz or so, 120, 180, really stop seeing a big difference uh, as frame rates increase. Um, so maybe the ceiling of a good frame rate is 150 to 200. If you're a gamer, you know, you know, going above 30 is good, um, but going to like a thousand, like, whatever. Um, the third thing that we're going to include in this is what's called the flicker fusion threshold. Um, when light modulates, flashes on and off, uh, at a low frequency, you can see the flashing. But if it happens fast enough, you start to see light as continuous. Um, I, have a little, I have a little video here that I'm not going to play because I don't want to like trigger epilepsy in anyone here. Um, but you can find this on YouTube, um, see a light that flashes faster and faster. And at about 50 hertz, uh, most people start to see light as continuous and no longer flashing. Um, this is the principle uh, behind uh, fluorescent lights. Fluorescent lights modulate at 100 or 120 hertz, depending on the country. Um, but we don't see the modulation. We see it as continuous light. On the other hand, uh, fluorescent light is kind of fatiguing. If you spend a whole day only under fluorescent conditions, uh, your eyes get tired. Because uh, even if your brain doesn't see the um, flashing, you know it's not natural light. 
Uh, so it turns out people can actually see artifacts of modulating light up to about 500 hertz, mostly for green. We're more sensitive to green than other colors. Um, but yeah, there's a range there. Um, you might be asking, what about film? Film was shot at 24 frames per second. Um, how does that work? Uh, it turns out projectors would actually flicker a light two or three times per frame. So a, fr a film shot at 24 frames per second actually um, flashes. Uh, the light actually f has a refresh rate of 48 or 72 hertz, which is why film see, uh, appears to be continuous. <sighs> so this is kind of where we are. Um, frame rates should be above 15, probably below you know, 220. Um, and if you have a flickering source, like a CRT monitor or a projector, be above 50. Um, I don't know a lot about VR. I'm sure some of you here do, but I think this is important for VR, right? Like ref low refresh rates are, feel unnatural. You can't like really immerse yourself in a condition with lower refresh rates. You need to push those higher in order to um, feel comfortable or at home in a kind of VR environment. Okay, one last topic we're gonna to talk about, and that's color. Um, color is very complicated. Uh, we could spend like four hours talking about this here. Uh, so I'm just gonna like touch on a couple of things. Um, but um, based on my understanding, color works by magic. Um, <laughs> it's, it's complicated. Uh, you get philosophical at some point, like is blue for you the same as blue for me? Um, but our eyes see with rods and cones. Um, our rods pick up low light, uh, our, our low light vision, and the cones are what see color. Um, you have three kinds of cones, short, middle, and long, that each pick up a different part of the uh, spectrum of visible light. So short cones pick up blue light, um, middle and long cones pick up green, yellow, and red. Uh, and they overlap a bit, and there's, there's a kind of diffing going on uh, between those. Um, so that's good to know, um, but that doesn't tell us like what a color is. How do, how do you, if I like have a blue object, how do I objectively define what that is? What's like the objective mapping of the subjective perception of color? Um, and researchers about 100 years ago solved this by shooting light into people's eyes. Um, so they took observers and they gave them one image in front of one, uh, one part of their field of vision and another over here, and they had adjustable light. And they could actually adjust the amount of 700 nanometer, 546 nanometer, and 435 nanometer light um, in order to uh, match the test color that they saw over there. Uh, and that got us our first color matching functions, where we could kind of objectively define what a color is. Um, and those 1931 experiments are still the foundation of color today. So I said at the beginning I was going to talk about kind of what's natural in video, what comes from science, as opposed to that weird human stuff uh, that we all know about. But this is kind of weird. Um, I'm going to get philosophical for just a second here. Um, we often think that science is this absolute thing. It's just given to us, and it just teaches us, like, truth. Um, but it turns out that's not how science works. Science answers questions, questions that can be empirically answered. Uh, and it's really, really good at that. Um, but it depends on the questions that are being asked. So can you even see what the question being asked here was? It was what, what do normal European men see when they see color? Um, do you see the limits of that question? It turns out that actually might matter. So the test subjects did not all see the exact same thing. There was variation. Uh, and as we get into wide color gamut displays, some of that variation in that 1931 color system means that colors actually start to cross named boundaries. Uh, and what one person identifies as red, another person identifies as orange. Um, it also turns out that about 12% of women have a fourth cone. So most of us have three cones, but some women have four cones. Uh, and not all of them, but some of them can actually see light that the rest of us can't see. There's an artist named Conchetta Antiago who, see, who paints. She's a tetrachromat, and she paints the light that she can see that the rest of us can't see. So I'm not saying any of this to like call science into question. Science is super important. I'm calling us to do the scientific work of asking hard questions and thinking about the assumptions behind what we do. Science can take us a long way, and if you work in video, it's really helpful to learn some of the science. 
but it's also worth pushing it forward. And science doesn't move forward unless we push it forward. One of the ways we can do that is finding the limits of the questions that have been asked, what were the assumptions, and asking if those assumptions are still true today, and finding out maybe what questions are being excluded, um, and where do we still have more work to do. Thanks. <laughs>